generations to come. Welcome to the TD and Riders Room, as always, brought to you by our good friends at Keeneland, racing as it was meant to be. I'm Randy Moss, probably best known. Uh, where is she? Lucy's back there somewhere. As the owner of Lucy, she probably thinks she owns me more than I own her. Zoe Cadman, TD Thornton. Zoe, it's like, where's Waldo with you every week? You know, where <laughs> in the world is Zoe this week, and you, you've you already had some adventures today. Tell us about what's going on with you. Yeah, I am actually down. Oh, look, there's the water. I am down on Crystal River. I came in for the Ocala sale. The breeze show starts tomorrow, and we decided that we would go kayaking on the Crystal River and try and find some manatees this morning, which we did not succeed. I think I was on the world's smallest kayak and almost tipped over a couple of times. So we're going to stick around and see if we can find any manatees. Fast horses and manatees. Uh, Okay. And TD, you're getting ready to embark on a, uh, on a nice trip that makes Zoe and I jealous. Tell us about that. Uh, well, right now I'm speaking to you from Boston, and I'm, I'm looking out the window here. I see no manatees up this far north, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to be heading down to Puerto Rico next week for my maiden voyage to to uh, to uh, Camarero. I almost said Cayamanas, the track in Jamaica, to Camarero, the former El Comandante. So I'll be able to cross another racetrack off of my visit list. How Very about cool. that? Well, I this past week I was in. Uh, well, I was actually in the studios in New York City where we were doing. The Found of Youth and the San Felipe and the first uh, the first racing first week in March series started off. We were really, really excited about the Fountain of Youth because we had Locked and we had Speakeasy and, of course, Doorknock and Victory Avenue. And we were going to see Nisos in the middle of the week. We were excited about that in the San Felipe. And we were going to see Just FYI make her first start in the Devona Dale as a three year old. Then one by one, horses began to drop out for various reasons. So when we did the Fountain of Youth, it winds up being Dornuck at odds of one to five. And guys, he won. Um, He didn't blow people away visually or by the numbers or anything like that. So how do you guys judge Dornuck's uh, win in his first start as a three-year-old? Well, we're going to have Danny Gargan on the show in a bit, and he'll he'll be able to explain a little bit more in detail about what happened. But the, the complexion of the Fountain of Youth really changed. We had three earlier scratches from the race. And then as the horses were warming up on the track, Speakeasy, who was vying for favoritism in the race, he was uh, just a, a, a notch below Doorknock's favoritism in the betting. He got loose, unseated his jockey ran into the rail, uh, suffered some cuts that needed some stitches. Obviously, he had to be scratched. That just totally changed the pace complexion of the race. And Danny Gargan had wanted to give Dornock a little bit of a schooling, have horses outside of him, have him stalk. And, and uh, he thinks he runs better with horses when he can see and engage with horses to his, to his immediate flank. Uh, the whole pace per- per- perspective had to change because of that. And, and he ended up sending Dornock to the lead. Didn't have to run all that hard to win. Uh, and But uh, I guess the flip side of that is it didn't really take much out of him. Yeah, and that's exactly what, what you saw. Louis Sires, no way, shape or form, wanted the lead. In fact, nobody wanted the lead. When they broke, Louis sat back on him and was just waiting for someone else to go. And they didn't. And he was way out there. So he just made the lead like he does. And he's just a giant baby Huey. He doesn't really know. He's unfocused. He doesn't know what he's doing. Looks like he's got a very small head or he needs a smaller pair of blinkers because those blinkers were almost over his eyes in the running of the race. Hey, he did what he needed to do. Did that look like a derby-like performance? No. Did the Remsen look like a derby-like performance? No. But when you watch him work in the morning, when he's beside another horse, when he's focused, and he works like a good horse, He works like a really good horse. This is a horse who hasn't put it all together. Will he put it all together in time for the Derby? I don't know. But there is a lot more to him than meets the eye. So I wasn't overly disappointed. I wasn't looking for a a stunning effort. We'll get to deterministic in just a little bit because he blew me away. But Donok, yeah, he's in. He'll go on. And I'm rooting for Danny. I really am. So I I agree with everything both of you guys said. Is it fair to say right now that with Dornick, it's more about potential than performance currently? 
Absolutely, it's more about potential. And we'll see what happens with Speakeasy coming back because I know when they announced the scratch and I was watching your show, Randy, no one really knew what was going on. But when they showed Speakeasy at the end of the shoot there at Goldstream Park, my eyes were just drawn to the rail that was down. And I'm like, man, he must have hit that rail because that rail is usually up. So while he looked fine at the end of the shoot and I was watching the NBC feed, because we weren't racing at Santa Anita. So I, I got to watch your pretty face all afternoon, Randy. And uh, I'm like, he must have hit that rail because the rail was down. And that's obviously what happened. So I'm looking forward to seeing Speakeasy because I did like him in that race. But hey, Dornot got the win. He got a little bit of experience. He, he just needs to focus. And I think the potential more than performance angle applies to a lot of sophomores this year. We we know that most of them uh, within the, the the top 12 or so are only going to be pointed on a two prep path to, to the Derby, two starts at age three. Uh, that's an angle that, that was pretty successful between about 2008 and 2016 in producing Derby winners. But you know what? Since 2017, those horses collectively with only two starts at age three, they've been 0 for 39. So it's easy to look at that race at the Fountain of Youth and say, okay, he beat Le Dom Bro by a length and three quarters. He beat Frankie's Empire by not much more, by two lengths. And neither of those horses are going to be confused with uh, with leading Kentucky Derby contenders. But uh, Dornock definitely um, is going to need to improve. And maybe you're right. Maybe uh, the baby Huey will become a uh, top-class racehorse by the time we get to the first Saturday in May. All right, the San Felipe. The next day, we'll go back and get to the Gotham. We'll save the best for last for you, Zoe. Uh, Nysos uh, was scratched. Bob Afford had second thoughts, is what he said, about entering. You know, should he have entered Nysos or not? He did. Uh, he felt later that probably he shouldn't have and scratched Nysos, but it ended up being a Bob Baffert exact uh, anyway uh, with imagination and wind me up dueling all the way down the stretch, 96 buyer speed figures for both horses, which put them right up near the top of, uh, of all the horses in the division. Uh, here we go again with the, uh, with the Bob Baffert dominance in Southern California with three-year-olds that won't be in the Kentucky Derby. And I thought it was astounding on the same weekend. It, uh, you know, this was a weekend that, let's face it, you could be putting a lot of pictures of triple crown candidates on the sides of milk cartons uh, searching for where they are <laughs> because they didn't show up this past week. So we don't have a lot to go off of. But what was astounding to me was this weekend was also the Preakness Future Wager, the first of two installments for the second jewel of the triple crown. And Nysos went off at five to two for a race that's two and a half months away. And to my knowledge, he hasn't even been publicly declared by his connections to be aiming for the Preakness. I think there's a lot of de facto assumptions on the parts of the betting public out there that these Bob Baffert horses who aren't going to Louisville because of the Churchill Downs corporate ban on Bob Baffert's participation in the Derby, there seems to be this uh, wholehearted assumption that they're all going to show up in the Preakness and Nysos is going to be the, the leader of the pack. We don't know that he's going to do that. He, he might run in the Santa Anita Derby and then show up in the in the 10 furlong Belmont Stakes at Saratoga. So I thought that was one of the one of the astounding uh, betting developments over the weekend, seeing this horse go off at two and a half to one for a race that he might not even start in. Well, Zoe and the San Felipe imagination won and things didn't exactly go perfectly for him during the running of the race. No, and we'll hear from uh, Frankie Dettori a little bit later on First Things First about his trip. But it, Imagination was the horse to beat in there. And you, you've really got a feel for trainer John Sadler and Scatify in here because he broke just a step slow. And there either was or wasn't room down on the inside. There was an inquiry that they looked at for an awfully long time at Santa Anita as to whether the fact if uh, J.J. Hernandez came over on top of Scatify. I don't think there was room and Scatify is a front running horse, a free running horse and just ran off onto heels. So the heels he hit were imaginations and imagination took off and went wide down the backside. So it was an ugly for a four horse race. It was an ugly first turn and Scatify took the worst of it, ran down the field in that race. And there was a big inquiry 
and thus he didn't garner any points. Bob's horses didn't garner any points, but John Sadler, who's looking to get his ownership group to the Derby, doesn't get any points because he was taken out in the first term. Bob gets the points, but he can't have the points. So you have to feel for some of the ownership in there. Imagination, a million dollar yearling. We've seen these connections time and time again. Get to the Derby, delighted for Frankie, who really had to ride hard to get by Captain Juan down on the inside aboard Wind Me Up in just the final final head bob, basically. Imagination gutted it out, but Wind Me Up ran a very, very good race indeed. He reminds me just a little bit of Medina Spirit in, in the, the sort of determination that he yeah. shows. So. So in your opinions, should there be any concern about the scratch of Nysos? Um, there's always a concern when a horse is scratched. I mean, you know, Bob Bob says it was his gut feeling and he's going to go somewhere else. Where he goes, I don't know. I know we weren't expecting to see him in the San Felipe, so it was a little bit of a surprise when he was put in there. Maybe he was put in there because Bob had two others in there and they wanted to make it a five horse field. I don't think so. I think Bob had all intention of running. And then at the last minute was like, yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to. And that's typical Bob. He waits till the last minute on most things and goes with his gut. So maybe, yeah, I would be a little bit concerned. Anytime a horse is entered in a race and scratched, you have to be a little bit concerned. And, and I don't think we're through with the, the whole Derby points conundrum because, again, Bob's horses aren't allowed to, to earn points because of the corporate ban imposed by Churchill Downs. And what happens looking forward? Bob had mentioned that uh, Nysos, he might just wait until the Santa Anita Derby. OK, that's that's logical. And last week or, or 10 days ago, he didn't enter Muth in uh, the Rebel Stakes at Oaklawn because he didn't like how Muth's final workout came off. And Muth might be ended and end up showing up in the Arkansas Derby. So now we have at the end of March and into early April, we have two important 100 point Derby prep races. And those horses are likely if they show up in those spots, they're likely going to be favored. So we could see a point where uh, those horses earn slash don't earn the points, e even though they've won the race. And it could wreak havoc for, for people farther down the list, just trying to scramble it, as Zoe said earlier, for, for looking for points to get in. Those those nine furlong races are really what put horses over the top in terms of getting into the Derby or not. And uh, I don't think we're done with the shakeout yet. You know, this is turning out to be an unfortunate year for Churchill Downs to continue its corporate ban of Baffert, uh, given now we're talking Nisos, we're talking Imagination, we're talking Wind Me Up, we're talking um, May Moon, who, uh, May Muth, who, who might wind up in the Arkansas Derby, as might Nisos, we'll see there. And then you got Muth, Cornell, I mean, you've got all these top three-year-olds out there that Baffert or, or perhaps budding three-year-olds like Cornell that that, uh, that Baffert has. All right, the Gotham Stakes at Aqueduct also on Saturday, one turn mile. Uh, Brad Cox had the favorite, the son of Justified, just a touch, was eight to five. Deterministic, Christophe Clement, second choice, seven to two. They ran one, two, but Deterministic gets the win. And Zoe, you've been following this horse for quite a while. Oh my God. I, he doesn't owe me any money. We'll just leave it at that. His maiden win at Saratoga was phenomenal. And I'd kind of forgotten about him until a couple of weeks ago where Christoph had announced that Deterministic was going to run in the Gotham. And I was like, oh, my God, Deterministic, the son of Liam's map they paid 625000 for. And I went back and looked at some of his works and he, oh, he'd been working absolutely phenomenally. And he ran like it. And he's a horse who is not pace dependent, even though he comes from off the pace. He can sit handy. He did it in the slop. He took all the dirt. He got a terrific ride under Joel Rosario. He wasn't asked for his best. Was he 100% fit? No, probably not. But he won anyway. Finished in a good time over a sloppy decimated track at Aqueduct 136.36. He's just fantastic. And he'll be my derby pick moving forward right now off of that. Um, he's a half to a, actually a, a mare that I just clipped a few weeks ago for trainer Carla Gaines called New Pie Lander, who's won for 28. So it's not like he's got all these astonishing half siblings. He's just a very good horse who was a beautiful looking yearling. And that has just moved forward. And he's a big 
big horse stands over a lot of ground. He's the type of horse when you see in the flesh, you're like, ooh, ooh, yeah, that's that's the one for me. So yeah, I thought that was very good. And seven to two, oh please, I could buy a manatee. <laughs> <laughs> and, and part of the the intrigue and, and interest with deterministic for me moving forward is his trainer Christophe Clement because. This is a gentleman who does not put horses on the derby trail too often. And when he, in fact, he's never had a derby starter. He's won, won the Belmont Stakes in 2014 with Tonalist. But for if, if, if Christoph decides to go down the derby path and he, and he, he runs in, say, a rate, he's bringing the, the colt back to Florida where he's been training. But if he shows up in the Florida Derby, the Wood Memorial, he's going to be a wise guy horse because betters will be all over the fact that hey, Clement doesn't send these horses here just to take a shot, just to get into the entry box for, the, for, for a race like the Derby. If he's going to go down that path, you know the horse has a chance and he, and he stands behind the horse. So I think that's part of the intrigue right there. There's exactly. no hiding him after that. There's no hiding right. him. Wherever no. he goes, he's going to get played. You're not, you're not no. hiding him. No way. He finished very, very strongly in the Gotham. After he breaks his maiden in Saratoga, he came up with a chip in an ankle, had to be surgically removed, so he didn't run again. As a two-year-old, about a month ago, we were talking to the Clement Barn uh, prior to the first Saturday in February about a horse that they were running. And then it, we were talking to Miguel Clement, Christophe's son. And then at the end of our conversation, it was like, oh, by the way, we've got a couple of three-year-olds this year that we are very excited about. And the emphasis was on very deterministic was one capital idea was the other, but deterministic seemed to be the one that they were the most focused in on. So it's going to be fascinating to see how this horse develops for the Wood Memorial coming up next. All right. One more three-year-old Colt prep race to talk about briefly the Bataglia at Turfway Park. Uh, one to nobody surprised by Brad Cox. Brad's kind of the new Todd Pletcher. Uh, he's joining Todd Pletcher in terms of being able to spot these horses in all the different Triple Crown prep races and successfully get horses points to get into the Derby. This one, Encino, defeats even money favorite Epic Ride in that mile and a 16th uh, Tapita prep at Turfway Park. Any thoughts on that one? He was four wide on both turns. He ran up on the heels of the favorite Epic Ride at the 316th pole. Uh, once, um, Axel Concepcion got him straightened out, he chugged on, on home, uh, not, not a big explosive final furlong there, but he, he covered the ground and now his connections are going to have to decide, do they stay on, on the tapita at Turfway and aim for the Jeff Ruby stakes on March 23rd, or do they branch out and try him in a nine furlong traditional dirt race, uh, somewhere else for his next start? I thought he ran a good race. Um, I didn't see it in person. I just actually watched it this morning. Um, he was getting five pounds from the favorite, which certainly helped. Axel's book is actually handled by Brad Cox's son. Axel, a good apprentice, was riding on the East Coast, moved his tack to Turfway for the winter. So I thought he ran well. Did I see a future Derby winner in there? No. Has it happened before? Yeah, Animal Kingdom prepped at Turfway Park. So you, you just never know. Um, I'm crossing everyone off my list after deterministic. I'm sorry. I'm I'm all in. I'm all and, in. And rich like strike. To... Rich yeah, Rich Strike prepped at Turfoy Park as there well. Go, after yeah. Uh, be yeah, but before his big shocker. All right, the three row Phillies also prepped for the Oaks and the Devona Dale and the Busher. Uh Fiona's Magic wins the Devona Dale at nine to one. Yet another long shot win for trainer Michael Yates, who seems to be specializing in that recently. And then in the Busher. Uh, Jody's pride was odds on and did her thing. She just seems to win. Uh, she won the busher by daylight. Uh, any opinions on those two? I think uh, in the Devona Dale, it was another so-called milk carton race because just FYI, the, the, the two-year-old Philly champ didn't show up. She spiked a fever and had to be scratched. So we're, we're looking for her to make uh, her sophomore debut at some point. Uh, nine to one wire to wire win for Fiona's magic. Uh, some soft splits. Uh, she did repulse several challenges. I think the one thing to note for me out of that race was that the three to 10 favorite Leslie's Rose, uh, just looked like she wanted no part of being raided on the inside. She was kind of nudged along to come through with the rail to her inside and some fillies to the outside. She had a couple of chances, but really was not enthused about kicking on through in there. And in, in the busher, uh, I, I like what I saw from Jody's pride. I, I saw after the race, Jose Lascano 
Her jockey said she took off at the quarter pole like she was breaking out of the gate. She galloped out well. Uh, trainer Jorge Abreu said uh, perhaps the nine furlong gazelle at Aqueduct is next. And perhaps uh, he could parlay that into an Oaks start in, at Churchill Downs on the first Friday in May. And I know Zoe was particularly disappointed in the scratch of just FYI. She's still my top pick for for the Kentucky Oaks. I watched some of her works at Payson Park, and she has done what I thought she would do, filled out into a beautiful filly. She got sick. She was scratched. We didn't see her run. So um, she's still on my number one list. But I, I thought it was a good race for Fiona's Magic. Uh, Michael Yates obviously has the keys to this race, having won it with Darth Vader last year. Leslie's Ro Rose, the runner-up on the rail. She wanted no part of the rail. I, I didn't think she had any excuse not to get through where she was. She was just maybe intimidated a little bit. No excuses for me. She just got beat on the day by a better filly in Fiona's Magic. We'll hear from you in a minute about her, Randy, because you were very high on her. And then the busher, Jody's Pride. I thought she ran great on a very, very sloppy racetrack. Uh, Steve Westland, the owner, Parkland Thoroughbreds have now won that race three times. Venti Valentine and Express, Espresso Shop. She, final time, not all that great, 138.49. She went 13 and changed for the last eighth of a mile, but she won it. And that was her first start back. So, yeah, we'll, we'll move on. I would still like to see her on the dirt, on the turf, but everyone keeps telling me she's better on the dirt, so I have to go with them. Uh, to me, the Kentucky Oaks right now is as wide open as I can remember yeah. it uh, in a long time. As well, especially since Kenza can't run, right? Kenza's the Bob Baffert uh, three-year-old filly who's, who's going to run in the Santa Isabel, I guess, uh, this weekend. Um, so, TD, you're, when you file your uh, weekend review this week, uh, not to – you know, not to downplay the, the performances that we saw. Uh, are, are the scratches really the big story of the last week? Uh, unfortunately, yes. As, as a as a journalist, when you're writing about these things and trying to recap the week and review, you don't want to be focusing on horses who didn't run. Uh, that really is not the point of it. But it, it it's hard to ignore that. It's 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 the elephant in the room, so to speak, and especially with. Um, you know, th this fact that, again, horses are only going to be we're only going to get brief glimpses of these horses before they hit the starting gate on the first Saturday in May. And th there's not much to go by. The trainers in trying to evaluate their own stock, sometimes it hur it hurts them as 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 well. But the question I'd throw back to you, Randy, with, with having to do with the buyer speed figures is what do you make of the fact that there has been so little progression this year collectively among horses from age two to three who are aiming for the Derby. We've now seen uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, we've seen Dornock. We've seen Fierceness and Timberlake all run buyer speed figures that have not progressed from age two to age three. In the case of the first three that I mentioned, they've actually regressed. And Timberlake has held his own pairing up 93 numbers for three consecutive starts. Usually you like to see a little more oomph, no? You do. Oh, you totally want to see a little more oomph. I mean, you know, speed figures of uh, even 93 for Timberlake, but 90 and 89 and 88 are generally second tier contenders for the Kentucky Derby, even in the first the first part of March. I am expecting, though, I'm expecting one or more of these prep races to uh, to really give us that step forward that we hoped we would see in the penultimate preps. But that remains to be seen, and it's so wide open. I mean, which prep is it going to be? And, of course, Nysos has run that fast, but, again, you know, he's not in the mix. So, All right, while we're recapping races, we really should mention the day at Santa Anita and the big cap, as well as the Kilroy Mile. Bob Baffert winning three of the four stakes on that day, taking down the Kilroy Mile with one of my favorite horses, Du Jour, with – those giant, huge throwback ears. He's a six-year-old gelding, got an absolutely brilliant ride by Flavian Pratt, who spoke to me after. And it's not often you really see Flavian smile after a race. Do you know what I mean? He loves horses. He's like, sorry, I just love this horse. He's so honest. He's such a cool horse, and he was grinning from ear to ear. So coming off a layoff, he last saw him in the Breeders' Cup turf running. He, he was beaten, what, three and a half lengths. So... He won that one. Of course, he won the San Felipe and then the big cap with Frankie Dettori, who was here 
in the 80s galloping for Chris Beck at my old boss who put him on his first winner out here. He was here when Ferdinand and Ali Sheba ran in the big cap. And for him to win it for Bob was pretty amazing. It was a really good day of racing at Santa Anita on Saturday. Sunday. Sorry, it was Sunday. This is a perfect example of how clued in Zoe is to the physical part of the race where TD and I both follow the horses a lot. I don't think either one of us would have noticed the ears on Du Jour. Watch them. Look at those ears the next time you see them. That is a sign of a lovely, honest horse. I love a big set of ears. We do want to remind you the TDN Rice's Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Entries are now open. You've been waiting for this for the 2024 April Horses of Racing Age sale. The sale meet will be held Friday, April the 26th after the races on closing day of the spring meet. Entry deadline for the print catalog is April the 1st and supplements will continue to be considered until the sales date. We'll be right back after these messages from Keeneland. At Keeneland, a horse will always be measured in hands. Hands that see, that sense, that speak. Hands that hold our sport to a higher standard. Not for our sake, but for theirs. For the love of the horse. For generations to come. The fastest horse of the week this week is brought to you by Global Campaign, one of those fast sires at Windstar Farm. On the track, Global Campaign won six out of ten starts, including three graded stakes. He had the second fastest Peter Pan stakes ever. And he closed out his career by winning the Monmouth Cup with a 101 buyer, then winning the Woodward with a 104, and finally third in the Breeders' Cup with a career-high 107 buyer speed figure. And on the pedigree page, he's a son of Curdlin out of an AP Indy mare and also a half-brother to successful young stallion Bolt Doro. Fifteen two-year-olds by Global Campaign are being offered at this week's OBS March sale. This is Hip 191, a beautiful colt selling with Eddie Woods. And Woodside Ranch is offering two global campaigns, a Colt, hip number 153, and a Philly, 692. You can be like Zoe and be there in person and check them out live, or you can go to obssales.com. The fastest horse of the week was part of that Baffert Brigade Sunday at Santa Anita. Zoe's already mentioned his big ears. Du jour, who burst through along the rail to win the Kilroe Mile, Bob Baffert's first grade one winner on turf in nearly 15 years. And this one has the added benefit of being co-owned by Baffert's wife, Jill, along with Debbie Lanny. Du jour, a career high 103 buyer speed figure to earn the designation as the fastest horse of the week. All right, let's get some more news nuggets out of the way here. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the new Tapita track at Santa Anita, Zoe, is now open for business. It certainly is, but not fully open because the track needs a little bit of time to settle. And we saw this down at, at Goldstream Park as well. So right now they're just jogging on it. Um, no toe grabs are allowed because you don't need them on the Tapita racetrack. So they're, they're going to jog on it for a couple of weeks and then they'll start galloping and then start working. But it's a welcome addition to Santa Anita. It was a little bit overdue. It took a little bit more time due to the rain to get it put in. But it looks terrific, and we are really, really looking forward to using it. So everyone that's been on it thus far has had rave reviews, but they're still only jogging on it right now. And TD Belmont Park is going to have uh, pretty much the same kind of setup, right, with a, uh, with a new Tapita track that's going to be installed there. Yeah, and I understand that in the, in the case of the one that just opened at Santa Anita, they've used a differently formulated wax uh, to handle the Southern California climate, which is different from where Tapita is elsewhere in the country. Um, remember in the, in the previous iteration of the, the synthetic tracks, when they were mandated at, at, the, at the large California tracks, they were very inconsistent from the morning training till the afternoon. Obviously, this tr track is only going to be used for training at this point, but uh, it's an $8 million investment, something that might not resonate with the general public. We're not going to see it or, or deal with it on a, on a daily basis. However, it is a big part in making sure everything goes well uh, on a regular basis at Santa Anita yeah. for training. Uh, the different wax, courtesy of Joan Wakefield of Tapita, 
Uh, she and Michael Dickinson have Tapita Farm. I've actually uh, uh, been able to see their room at Tapita Farm where where they uh, formulate all of the Tapita. And Michael Dickinson has been called the mad genius. Well, Joan Wakefield could be the mad scientist. They've got all of these different versions of Tapita on the shelves, different colors, different wax formulations and things like that. So uh, they've got this one ready to go now at Santa Anita. Uh, TD, also another huge announcement this past week, again from First Racing, this one about not only an increased purse of the Preakness Stakes, but also some very interesting bonus tie-ins to the California Crown and to Pegasus. Tell us about those. Yeah, and, and to back up just a bit, you know, owners and trainers were clamoring for purse increases for the three Triple Crown races, and they got them in fairly short order within the span of just the past three months. The Derby purses increased from three to five million. Preakness and Belmont both getting a bump up from 1.5 to 2 million. And the bonus series, I, I'm, I'm not really sure what, what to make of this. It's a, it's a $5 million bonus package to a horse that, that sweeps these three races that are all owned by, all under the control of first racing. The Preakness, the California Crown, which is going to be the renamed Awesome Again Stakes coming up in, in September at Santa Anita. And then the Pegasus at Gulfstream Park. There's also going to be kind of a sister series at a lower price point, two and a half million linking three grass races. Um, that, you know, you hear that that's a big number. You hear a $5 million bonus out there. I don't know exactly what bang for their buck they will get uh, by dangling that big money. I, I think the intent is to drum up interest for the middle leg in that series, the, the awesome again. Um, but it, there's just going to be such a small pool of horses who are eligible to run for it that I don't know if, if it makes a big impact. I know last year, if, if you looked at 2023, uh, National Treasure would have been in for the for the running there. He uh, won the Preakness. He participated in the Awesome again. He ran fourth. And then, of course, he, he won the Pegasus down at Gulfstream. Uh, but that still would not have been good enough to get the $5 million bonus if it was on the line then. Well, I mean, we have to applaud Belinda Stronach and First Racing because this money is squarely coming yes. out of First Racing pocket. It's not coming out of the pool out at Santa Anita, which is already in a deficit. She is reaching into her Chanel purse and pulling out millions of dollars and putting it on the line for these races. She wants it to be similar to the Pegasus down at Goldstream Park, which revenued 47 million for their Super Saturday of racing there. She has really turned that into a fantastic event and all of the expenses are on her for that and they're going to be on her for the california crown as well so it's a welcome addition could some of that money be put into the day-to-day -day purses yes it does but it's not coming out of our day-to-day -day purses which is probably the key point here it's coming out of that chanel purse so we need to applaud Belinda Stronach for that. It's three races in an eight month period with bonuses through the yin yang. When you consider, even if you're not looking for the bonus, you have the John Henry turf. That's going to be a million dollars up from 200,000. The Eddie D, six and a half down the hill. That was, I think, 100 or 200,000. That's going to be 750,000. All of these purses are terrific, and we're looking for the California crown to be the crown jewel of racing in California and make it an event, much like the Pegasus is an event in South Florida. So I, I've got nothing but high praise, even though I work for the Stronach Group, but this is something that you can get excited for. I'm not getting paid extra for this, just just so you know. But Could I'm, I'm really more. looking to it. Like it's going to be like yeah, a mini Breeders' Cup, right, Randy? Yeah, yeah total agreement. Uh, anything that makes racing more lucrative and more interesting, I think we all should be applauding. Meanwhile, the TD and Riders Room is also brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. We're well into breeding season, and to view all the Pennsylvania stallions, go to pabred.com and click on that link that says 2024 Stallion and Boarding Farm Directory. This is really all about the dollars and cents. If you win a $50,000 maiden special weight rates at parks, for example, you get $30,000 to the winner. 
But if that horse is a is by a Pennsylvania stallion and is a registered Pennsylvania bred, that thirty thousand dollar winner share becomes fifty eight thousand eight hundred, almost double. That's about like winning a one hundred thousand dollar maiden special rate race anywhere else. So take a look at those PA stallions. It'll be worth your while. And if you have any questions, please contact Brian Sanfrontello. His number 610-444-1050. 610-444-1050. The state of Pennsylvania has the best breeders program in the entire United States. When you buy a yearling, it's a little bit like buying a lottery ticket. And we are trying to provide a lottery ticket that the likelihood is to hit the jackpot. Angel of Empire wins the Arkansas Derby and wins it clear. Uncle Heavy late, it's a photo finish. Pennsylvania and the PHBA have the best state bred program in the country, bar none. The winner, Uncle Heavy, he's a three-year-old bred in Pennsylvania. The rumbling started early and only intensified with performances that sent shockwaves across the nation. The center of it all. Epicenter is at the top of the three year old class in the run happy Travers. Epicenter, three year old champion by Not This Time. Cool More America, home of champions. This week's Cool More Stallion of the Week is Epicenter. And Epicenter sells himself if we just show you some of his foals on the ground. This is a filly out of Seize the Market, bred by Blackridge Stables, the breeders of three-time grade one winner Bast, and also grade two winner Mutasabek. Here's a colt out of Secret No More, bred by Macmur Hall, who has brought us Teppin, Gina Romanica, Search Results, Gift Box, Premium Tap, all grade one winners, and more. Next up, this is a filly out of Joyfully. Joyfully is a half-sister to graded six winners, Divine Oath and Auntie Joy. And Joyfully's third dam is Personal Ensign. This filly was bred by International Equities Holding. This is a Winchell Thoroughbreds filly out of Adirondack Stakes winner Just Wicked. This little girl is a three-quarter sister to multiple grade two winner and a million and a half dollar earner, Wicked Halo. And last but not least, here's the firstborn foal by Epicenter. This colt's dam, Mongolian Rose. Is a half sister to Schuylerville winner Georgie's Angel and Bourbon winner Lawn Ranger. The breeders of this cult, Mulholland Springs and Tom Grether Farms. And Zoe, you'll be looking at these along with others. Any thoughts? And and honestly, the one thing that struck me about the epicenter foals is that they have a lot of length to them and a lot of leg. Now, anytime you look at a foal, you rarely see an ugly looking foal. I think I am the only person on earth that's ever bred an ugly foal, look like a kangaroo coming out. Um, so the breeding game is over for me, but almost any foal, the jury's out until you see them a little bit later on. But I will say the epicenter foals have a good bit of length and a lot of leg. So there is an awful lot to like about them. Just don't buy any foals that I bred because they make really nice show horses about four years down the road. On that note, it's that time of the podcast again to remind you that the TD and Riders Room is brought to you by the Green Group, a tax accounting and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry and designed to save you taxes. Our Green Group guest of the week is trainer Danny Gargan, still basking in the glow of Dornuck's win in the Fountain of Youth on Sunday at Gulfstream in his first start as a three-year-old. So Danny Dornock. He didn't break any watches in the Fountain of Youth. He didn't draw off and win by six links or eight links. To your credit, you said before the race that Dornock was going to be maybe 85% for the Fountain of Youth. So how do you think his win in the Fountain of Youth should be viewed? Well, I mean, he's out there playing around by himself. He only He's going to wait on horses. We all know that. I wanted to rate him in the race and have somebody in front of him. Because when he gets out there, he plays around and waits on other competition to get around him. Uh, it's not his fault nobody was fast enough to get next to him. If they would have, he'd have ran faster. Danny, uh, one of the interesting things that I found in, in trying to prepare for this interview was that when you went to the Derby in 2019 with Tax, uh, he was a horse that you went and claimed for $50,000 at Keeneland. And uh, you ended up 14th in the Derby that year, and, and Tax ended up running 
outrunning his peers in terms of longevity. He ran until early last year. But uh, your path with Dornock was a little bit different. Your clients went to Keeneland at the yearling sale and purchased him for $325,000. And I'm kind of interested in knowing in at, at that point, nobody knew who his half-brother Mage was. Mage was four months away from his first start and then another few months away from winning the Kentucky Derby. What was it like last winter for you, knowing that uh, you had a horse that would be cycling into your barn at some point as a two-year-old as you watched Mage progress into the Derby winner that we now know he is? I mean, it was exciting because uh, I actually owned a big part of him until Mage ran second in the Florida Derby. Uh, it was, you know, it's exciting to have a horse that's bred that well and you know, just lucky. You know, I had defunded's full sister, Ringy Dingy, who I, who's a stakes winner also. So, you know, anytime you're buying young horses, you kind of lean towards a little pedigree. But we'd seen mages at uh, Maryland at the two-year-old training cell, and he was uh, a nice-looking horse that uh, kind of liked him that day uh, when he breezed. And we knew he had talent also before we bought mage, or before we bought doorknock. We knew mage could breeze good and showed some talent. So it wasn't a complete unknown brother. Danny, before we go back, I want to talk about the race again. And first off, congratulations. But what, what was going through your mind with all the scratches that went on, especially the scratch in the post parade? Like, what were you thinking? Because you kind of run high. You have a high energy level. So how was Danny Gargan during all of this time with everything that was going on? Well, I ran out on the track and told Louie to just go ahead and go to the lead because I told him to rate. And at that stage, I went down the steps. It's on video. It's kind of funny. I uh, went down the steps and told him, just go ahead and go. Uh, when Todd's horse got loose and ran into the rail, which was unfortunate. You never want to see anything happen to a beautiful horse. And he cut himself up. But he went. I had to go down and just change our game plan completely because uh, I didn't want to get behind one of those horses and get have them get in our way. So we just went ahead and decided to just go to the lead. Anxious moments in the running of the race? Uh, I just never, it, really, no, it was pretty, it was a pretty relaxed atmosphere at that stage. I mean, it took forever to get him in the gate. He handled himself real well. You know, they were out on the track probably 10 minutes, 15 minutes longer than they normally would have been. It was humid day. He never got hot, never broke out. Uh, no, it was pretty relaxed. I mean, it was really not a lot of pressures. It was, wasn't that, you know, I never was worried at all. So I got a couple of questions here. First of all, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around this visual. So you're up on the steps and yeah. on the track apron, the starting gate is, is just forward of the finish line. So it's right in front mm -hmm. of you and you see that speakeasy is scratched. So you have to run down to the rail as the horses are walking to the gate. So you well, can shout down, where they walk out right where the, you know, the, where the stand is, where they do the interviews and they're on TV. I run them down to the track where the horses walk on the track and Louie's right around that area. And we had to have a conversation again, but he knew what we wanted at that stage. He's a pretty smart kid. Did he, did he see you coming or and move the horse over to you? Did you have to shout yeah. at him? How to, how to no, he came right over and I said, you know what this means? He said, yes, go. I said, okay. <laughs> All right. So, so part, part two of my question, you pointed out uh, after the race that not only did you think he was 85%, you explained why that he had had just four breezes leading in to the fountain of youth. Now we all know there are all kinds of different ways to train racehorses. It's not a science, it's an art. Why did you choose? Um, why did you choose to bring Dornock into the fountain of youth with that kind of schedule? Well, you know, I've been in a situation where I've won the Remsen before, and I felt like, yeah, it's going to be a long year. We wanted to give him time off. We gave him some time off, some weather hit, this hit, and I didn't want to overtrain him into the race. And, you know, it's going to be a big year. We have all year to get him fit. We didn't expect, you know, he's, you know, people think you have to win every race, and uh, everybody gets that in their head. We were just hoping to get a good start in him and maybe win next time or run second and be in the Derby. Danny, um, we hear in the media 
have a tendency to want to know the second after a horse crosses the finish line, what his next prep race is going to be if he's on the derby trail. And of course, any rational trainer wants a little time to evaluate and and think about what's going on. But now that we've given you a, a good 72 hours as we're taping this, we've heard Florida Derby mentioned, uh, bluegrass stakes. What's your preference? You're leaning in, in any direction at this point? I mean, I, I said it. And last December, it would be the bluegrass. Uh, I'm leaning towards the bluegrass, but we don't, you know, Florida Derby could come up a field we want to be in. We're not going to limit ourselves to anything. We're going to train like we're running in the Florida Derby. If we go to the bluegrass, we go there. I haven't decided anything at this particular time. Uh, we're just going to enjoy where we're at right now. And uh, lucky enough that we didn't have to run that hard to get the points. We're already probably in the race now that uh, Bob won the race in California and 75 points off the table out there. It's kind of getting to a situation where we can cruise in and figure out probably know something later next week where we might be pointing, but I'm leaning towards the bluegrass. Danny, do you feel a bit vindicated? Because I'm fortunate enough to spend all summer in Saratoga. And this is a horse who you have been talking about since the spring. He's the best horse in your barn. He's still a giant baby Huey. He hasn't put it all together. But do you feel a little bit vindicated in knowing what kind of horse you had before he ever ran and the fact that he's done what he's done thus far? Well, yeah, I kind of put my foot in my mouth up there. Uh, in the summer, <laughs> Dave Brennan did an article and I said he's the best horse I ever trained. And, you know, no one's arguing with that anymore. Um, he's It's when you have a horse that has a stride like this and he's such a beautiful animal, it's pretty easy to see how talented he is watching him breeze with the other horses. It's, it's fun. I mean, he was out working W and L like so easy. It was, it's, I mean, it was an exciting summer just having him there and it's been exciting to have him all year. Danny, for those, for those that watch the race and they're like, yeah, you know, he's just okay because he's on his wrong lead and he's lollygagging and he's all over the place. And then to watch him work next to another horse, he's two different horses. How can you explain that? We just got to get someone fast enough to get next to him. <laughs> I mean, it's simple. I mean, if someone, he only has to, he only, if someone will get next to him, you're going to see a fast horse. I mean, he does explode working, but you know, Louie was just sitting there playing around. He'll wait on competition because he, you know, he wants to play with, he's a big boy and wants competition, wants to play on him. But, you know, the big key the other day, and I told Louie, don't worry about leads, don't do anything. Do not be yanking him around because I don't want to get DQ'd or hit the rail. When a when horse is up his inside, Louie took a minute to do anything because he doesn't want him to run into the other horse next to him because he's, you know, if you get to play him, he'll, he'll jump on next to, in his competition. He'll lean into him and might bounce off of him or anything. We just want to run straight right now. And if it's an 88 buyer, or, you know, people, I don't really take any interest in buyers. You know, we call them the rolling buyer in horse race and they change every other day. So uh, they're not anything that anybody pays any attention to. So uh, who's out there any faster? CL Leon got an eight, a 90 and I think he's probably the horse to beat. So other than that, I'm not really too concerned about any numbers. It's just keeping him running straight and keeping him healthy is going to be the thing. Well, since I'm one of the guys that does the buyer speed figures, I'd have to take a little know, bit of an exception to that, but that's okay. Um, we've changed Dornox so, Maiden when you did it three different times, so you're used to being right. teased. So my question, uh, we talked to you, Jerry Bailey and I, a couple days before the race, and you just mentioned hit the stride on Dornock. And you told us an interesting story about how that was really the first thing that you noticed that told you that he was a good horse. Kind of share that, share that with everybody, if you don't mind. Oh, we, you're at Saratoga and, you know, you're wearing you know, workouts and we liked him. He's a big, pretty horse. And uh, he worked out the gate and uh, I've got the binoculars on him and whew, did he work good. And he worked with the Philly Ringy Dingy. And she broke lightning fast. He's about two jumps behind her and he made up that two jumps i mean instantly and they were 46 and one and i was like oh my goodness he does have a turn of foot it's crazy and uh that day i knew that we had something danny i'm just curious to know you've been to the derby once with tax he was not a favorite for the race um but you obviously it's the derby is one of those things as a, as a trainer you don't learn it until you actually go through it even if like you you grew up in louisville and you've been around the racetrack all your life 
What did you learn from going through the Derby with tax that you might be able to apply to, to Dornock's journey this year, especially considering they're, they're different horses and that tax was not one of the favorites and, and Dornock figures to be one? Well, it was, it's a totally different situation. I'm kind of leaning back to the days when I worked for Nick Zito now. I mean, this is a, I mean, he's a contender. He's a live, live horse in the race. Tax was just a fun thing to go because, I'm, you know, people want to run in the Derby. Uh, we were just happy we were there. Uh, it's a totally different situation with this horse. You have to look back and see the things when you worked as an assistant, when you actually had a chance to win it. And I've done a lot of the things I've done with this horse that Nick did with Louis Gutierrez and go for Jen. You know, I gave him the time off. Tack walked him in the barn. I've done pretty much the same things. Was going to give him his first race uh, to set him up for his next race. So we've done things that I learned in the past, but it had tax was a totally different thing. He was a horse that we were just trying to get there. I believe we have a horse that can actually, if we get him in the gate on the first Saturday in May, he's had a chance to win it. So it's a totally different ballpark, and it's a fun thing to be a part of, and hopefully we get lucky and we're there. And, Danny, that's a perfect segue to my next question. You've been around an awful long time. We've been friends a long time. You've it's always older than you all think. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, now we have a pack, just remember. So for people that don't know Danny Gargan, which is hard to believe at, at this point in your life, give us a, a brief outline of what you've done in your life because you've pretty much done everything. You've been a groom, a hot walker, an assistant, a jocks agent. Take us through your life story up to now real quick. Well, my father was a jockey, and he passed away when I was a kid. And I grew up right outside Churchill Downs on First Street. And there's a couple of trainers that grew up in that same neighborhood. Brad Cox grew I was on First and Evelyn. He was over on Fourth and Evelyn. So uh, we all grew up, you know, just going to the races. You know, in the summer, everybody got a job because no one had any money. So we all worked. And I was lucky enough, a few few trainers took a shine to me. Uh, Merrill shares like a father figure to me most of my life. And uh Worked for Lucas as a kid a lot, and then I, you know, just transitioned into every phase. And I didn't expect to be a trainer. Uh, when I quit being an assistant, I went to be a jock agent, and I had a lot of fun doing that, and we made a lot of money, and and uh, just ended up buying some horses, tinkering around, and flipping them, and had three or four horses, and stayed up in New York, and it snowballed at one time. I had 50, 60 horses, and uh, here we are today. I don't train as many anymore. We keep it under 50 all the time, but uh, it's still fun to have, you know, a stable of 40 horses and, you know, get 15, 16 year olds. And hopefully we get lucky and uh, can keep being on the Derby trail and keep doing interviews. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and one of the things that you notice with your interviews, I know, is that this time of year, people not only analyze these three-year-olds a lot, they overanalyze them, really. And people in the media are addicted to rankings. Give us your top 10. Give us your top eight derby horses in order. Um, I, so, like I said, I think Sierra Leone deserves to be the favorite. Uh, Timberlake. Yeah. I'd say him and Timberlake deserve to be the favorite. I'm good with being third or fourth choice. Uh, I'm okay with uh, being fifth. I'm not going to rank everybody. They're, you know, Those trainers have done more than me. They're more successful and have more horses. And you never know who's going to end up where, but uh, we're just happy to be a part of it, you know, and be in the mix where we are in that kind of situation. You know, like I said, we only get like 14 or 15 two-year-olds. I think I had four, four or five Colts that were not New York breads. To have one of this caliber out of a small package like that, it's hard to do. People don't understand that aspect of the game. You know, these other guys have 150 two-year-olds and uh, they have 35, 40 Colts. So uh, we're just blessed that we got lucky and one of them fell through the cracks of all these big buyers. So I'm curious. Okay, so Sierra Leone won his first prep of the year in the Risen Star. Dornock won his first prep of the year in the Found of Youth. You ran against Sierra Leone and beat him in the Remsen. Why would you put Sierra Leone over Dornock at this point? Well, I think the public will, and it's okay with that. Ah. I don't want to be picked first. It's a little bad luck. <laughs> uh, I'm happy with where we are, and I think we'll progress further. We, we'll, if both of us run in the bluegrass, at some stage he's got to pass me. So uh, I'll be in front of him, so he's got to come get me. And You know, you get 12 horses in, a, in the gate. Sometimes it's hard to catch the guys in front when you got to go 12 wide because you're not going to come up the rail at Kingland. It's going to be too jammed up. So uh, it'll be fun to watch these races. And Brooke Smith is a really good friend of mine that I've known for years, and 
I couldn't be happier for him. He's a great guy. Such a, I mean, it's, it's going to be a fun derby. There's going to be a bunch of guys from Louisville that are in the race, which is going to be fun. You know, Brad's got Timberlake, Brooke Smith has Sierra Leone um, and my horse. So it's going to be a Louisville derby this year. hopefully. What about the ownership group, 2-8 Racing of, of Doorknob? Uh, what can you tell us about, about them, Danny? It's just Jason Worth, and he's yeah. And I've never and for someone that's you know he hasn't been in horse racing that long. He's having a lot of luck. He loves horses as much as anybody I've ever met. It's funny because he the other day he went to the bar and I wasn't you know he came at like twelve or something. He was in the afternoon, maybe one o'clock, and he's walking around the barn. I get a text. So what's the story with this uh, Thanos? He's the pony, and he said <laughs> he's my favorite horse. <laughs> So he's in Leo. It, it doesn't matter if it's the pony or door knock. If he gets a shine for a horse, he's just going to stand there and feed him peppermints and pet on him and love on him. His favorite horse besides door knock is in my barn is Thanos, the pony. And, uh, but he is a beautiful horse with big old fat jaws on him. And, uh, he loves the pony, but he just loves being out there petting on his horses and just hanging out. And then he gets a, you know, he said, uh, winning a race is like hitting a home run in the world series. He said, you get a rush that you can't believe. And I, you know, I'm not going to hit any home runs anywhere, but uh, he's a great person to be around. He's so much fun. You guys should have him on the show because he'd love to do it. And I think he, it's good to have guys like him involved. And the day he bought in, I told him that. I said, look, I just bought a horse. I think it's going to be a really special horse. And uh, we talked about doing something. And I said, let's just get, you know, take a small piece of ham and it'd be fun to have you a part of it. And he's been having a blast with the interviews and doing things. Uh, he had three other major league baseball players with him the other day at the races. So it's, it's, you know, we need a good shine on horse racing and, and a good vibe. And he's one of those guys that we need to have involved. And and he's kind of easy on the eyes. I wouldn't mind meeting him. <laughs> easy though. You're about knee height. <laughs> <laughs> you got to watch over. anything else. Dan, just to wrap it up, I, I noticed uh, as I was preparing for the interview and, and looking at your stats on Equibase, as we're taping this on Tuesday, you are one start away, and you have one entered on, on Wednesday at Gulfstream from start number 2000, lifetime. Um, if you have your crystal ball handy and, and it's fired up, c with with the benefit of looking back on those first 2000 starts and looking ahead, if we're doing this interview in maybe three, five years time, what, what would you like the scope of your stable to be? And, and what would you like to be uh, to, to have in terms of a size and a caliber of stable? Well, like I said earlier, I'm not looking to train 250 horses or anything crazy like that. I, you know, we want to keep it around 50 and we'd like to have more two year olds every year. 25 to 30 would be lovely. But, you know, we're happy to be where we are. You know, in the past, I just claimed horses. I haven't claimed a horse in over a year. So to keep my stable at where it's at and not be claiming and, you know, doing that part of the game and turn, you know, we've transitioned into just young horses. I'm really happy where it's turned into in just a short period of time because we just started buying babies four years ago. And, you know, we won the Nash, won the Remsen last year. This year we've won the Remsen and the, and the Fountain of Youth. So uh, if we can keep coming up with young horses, hopefully we'll keep getting young horses from people. And uh, we're just blessed to be where we are. You know, my team does a really good job. I have really good riders. I've had the same you know, assistance since I started training. So uh, we're just trying, trying every day to do our best to keep getting the young horses and do our best to get them to where they can show their potential. Well, so far, so good. It's been fun already in the run-up to the 150th Derby. Got some more big races to come. And it's always fun when you get Danny Gargan involved in uh, in a spot like this. So, Danny, congratulations on the success so far. And good luck in the next month or so with Dornock. As the Green Group Guest of the Week, trainer Danny Gargan will receive a free one-hour tax consultation from Lynn Green et al. at the Green Group. For more information on how the Green Group can save you money right in that pocketbook, visit www.greenco.com. And now this message from the Green Group. Are you paying too much in taxes? The Green Group can help. There's a reason the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisors. They save you money and share successful strategies. Over the past 40 years, the Green Group founder, Len Green, has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport, like Eclipse Award-winning champions Jaywalk and Wonder Wheel. 
His DJ stable competes at the highest level and has received the game's most prestigious honors. Len Green's in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the thoroughbred business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. On this week's edition of First Things First, I was lucky enough to catch up with Frankie Dettori and talk about his terrific San Felipe win. And then Millie Ball caught up with Bob Baffert to discuss, amongst other things, Game On Dude and winning the Santa Anita Handicap. Frankie. Hi. You had to blow a little bit there. Hi. It was a bit of a different race. I got run into the first turn, I always got scared, then uh, he ran off in the back. I was managed to keep him away and uh, got him to relax again. You, and, you um, got scared, what do you, what do you mean? Well, the first turn, one behind ran into me, and he kind of clipped my horse's back legs, and my horse just got scared, and he ran off in the back. But uh, he didn't exactly plan out like I wanted to, but he showed great courage. It was a great duel with the captain. And we go there in front. Head, head with uh, one down the lane. Did, Captain did, one. Did you did you think you had it? No. <laughs> it's not giving me a tip across the wire, trust me. Did you ever spot a derby fever now, Frankie? Yeah, of course. Now everything's developing. This is one of the trials. I suspect it's going to race him in the derby against the other good one. But uh, it's all developing now. We had the fun to the view yesterday. Yeah, derby fever started. Thanks, Frank. Quite a day for the Bob Baffert team. Uh, this time, winning with Newgate in the Santa Anita Handicap. This is your sixth Santa Anita Handicap. Just talk about the preparation that you put into this horse coming into this race. Well, we were bringing along. We always thought he's going to be a better horse as he gets older, and we've been patient and just getting these races into him. And then today was supposed to be his his coming out party kind of race, and I was looking worried there turning for home looked like that horse had gotten away but uh, he just dug in and you know it's such an historical race and then to win it uh, for our team but with Frankie Dettori even makes it really special. Going back in the history of the San Diego Handicap for you, Game On Dude, right? He has just been announced as a finalist for the Hall of Fame. How do you feel about that? Well, I'm, I'm proud of all my horses and especially him. He was just when he was on, he was just unbeatable. He's one of the top horses I've ever had. And unfortunately, you know, he had he, his best race was probably the Breeders' Cup in Kentucky when it was so deep and muddy and he almost held on some long shot got him. But it's it's one of those things where, I, you know, I, I hope he gets in. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, have Justify in there too. Another unbelievable horse, crazy horse. I don't know if I have another one like him, but, but it just really, it, it makes you proud. And, you know, it's, it's nice to, to, you know, that they're in there. Great chapters in your lives to hold on to. Yes. Congratulations. Bob Baffert winning his sixth Santa Anita Handicap. Really great to hear from Bob and Frankie. And what a weekend they had winning three of the four greatest stakes at Santa Anita. Just a reminder that we are back at Santa Anita on Friday, Saturday and Sunday a 12.30 post time. We've got some good races coming up, including the grade one, the Holder Mile. Well, we all know it's easy for horses to win or easier for them to win if things go right. Sometimes horses can win even if things don't go right. But in the case of Cinderella's Dream and the Jumeirah Guineas last week at Maidan, Zoe, this horse was able to win when things went terribly wrong for Jockey William Buick. I mean, there's only one way to, de to describe this, right? A ball buster. Um, basically what <laughs> happens, sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Bill Buick was a boy. Okay. She was much the best and she's not a very big filly. They broke out of the gate and she pulls a little bit and Bill's a, a big guy, right? William Buick is tall and the saddle literally slipped forward up his neck. And it's happened to me. And it's a horrible feeling when your saddle slips forward. That is actually worse 
than when your saddle slips back. So somehow around the turn, William, for those of you actually watching the video of this, you'll be able to watch it. Somehow around the turn, he managed to kick his feet out of the irons. He got himself to the outside away from everyone, kicked his feet out. So by now his knees are down by the filly's legs because he's a very tall jockey. And wound up winning the race by gosh, eight lengths or something. It was a ridiculously easy effort. He gave her a couple of little slaps down the neck and she won going away. So I expect big things from her once he can actually get up in the saddle, but a terrific job of horsemanship by one of probably the best jockeys in Europe other than Ryan Moore in William Buick. You, you could almost read his mind as they were going around the turn. It was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then she starts drawing away and he's like, oh, what the heck? I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give her a couple of taps, you know, and she winds up winning anyway. He I said mean, it was like if a you're movie. a handicapper, yeah, that's something. And just seeing his balance and, and, and not panicking in that situation. Zoe, I've always wondered in that situation, the filly looked like, I mean, the horse must know something feels different. And I imagine they can either help their own cause or, or try and fight it and kick on with it. What, 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 is, what does the horse usually do to respond when, when the horse feels the, the legs out of the stirrups, out of the irons like that? She was the consummate professional. And you could see that she did try and slow down because he kind of eased her away from the other horses just in case he fell. He didn't want to be trampled. And it's hard enough when the saddle's up the neck. Like, it takes a good degree of balance to even get your feet out of the stirrups because you are literally resting on your toes. So you've got to push on the horse's neck to even get your feet out and you hope you get them both out at the same time and don't tip yourself off. So a big round of applause for William Buick because that was amazing. And if you're not watching this, just Google it on YouTube and, and you will find the best bull busting ride you ever saw in your life. <laughs> and the, the eventual outcome, obviously, it didn't hurt that she was obviously light years the best. Cinderella's yeah. Dreams owned by Godolphin and trained by Charlie Appleby. So, you know, no big surprise that she would have been the best in that field. Looking ahead now to some of the races that we can uh, that we'll be seeing this next weekend. Let's start at uh, at Santa Anita. Um, Adair Manor is <gasps> being pointed, I believe, for the Beholder Mile. Yep. She certainly is. And I knew you would be very, very excited. I'm going to pull up the entries. Uh, Jason Egan is my go-to, who is our terrific racing secretary at Santa Anita. And because we filmed this on Tuesdays, the entries aren't out. Probables, A Dare Man, A Desert Dawn, Green Up, Interstate Daydream, Queen Goddess, Sweet Azteca, and window shopping, a couple of possibles, Coffee in Bed, who I like for Richard Mandela and Kirsten Bosch. Maybe Big Pond, but it's a little bit quick back for Big Pond for trainer Tim Yakteen. So those are the probables for the Beholder Mile, the grade one event at Santa Anita this weekend. Are you still on Adair Manor, Mr. Oh, yeah. Randy Moss? Yeah. Oh, for yeah. Sure. I've, you know, she was a little disappointing in the Breeders' Cup, but uh, Adair Manor, I think. Uh, before that, she showed, especially in those races in Southern California, where she was just so dominant, you know. So I, I'll be surprised if she doesn't win again. Coffee in bed had a little intrigue for me there. Uh, she's yeah. going to be second time back off a November layoff for, for Richard Mandela. She was second, but only beaten a length in the La Cañada. And she's going to be turning back into a mile, a flat mile from a mile and a 16th, which I, I think might be right up her alley. So a couple of races also in Tampa. Uh, I'll save the Tampa Bay Derby for the end here. The Florida Oaks, unlike many of the Oaks this time of year, this one's on the turf at a mile and a 16th. Uh, looks like to me, just giving it a quick look, the favorites might be the second and third place finishers in the sweetest chant at Gulfstream Park that would be style points and dynamic pricing. The latter, of course, you can tell by the name is a Seth Klarman horse trained by Chad Brown. Uh, you guys look at that race at all? Uh, I, I had a little bit of... Little bit to a little bit of a shine to style points there for Christophe Clement. She broke her maiden at Gulfstream back on Christmas Eve. And uh, then she wheeled right back. She was second, only beaten a neck, stepping right up out of the maiden uh, ranks into the sweetest chant uh, behind the, the pretty decent life's and audible. And I, I, I think uh, she's the one that jumps out for me. I'm more intrigued about the Tampa Bay Derby and more specifically yes. domestic product, who I thought ran a very better than looked race behind Hades last time out. Um, 
So I, I'm going there. I know No More Time will be in there for uh, Jose D'Angelo, winner of the Sam F. Davis in his last start. But domestic product certainly is looming large for me in the Tampa Bay Derby. Now, we're taping this on Tuesday. The entries will be, uh, be drawn on Wednesday. So we're looking at the probables from the racing office. They include those two you mentioned, domestic product, no more time. Uh, Todd Pletcher is supposedly going to run Heartened, who has the same owners as Deterministic in the Gotham, uh, coming off a maiden win at Tampa. A very interesting horse, a three-year-old colt that uh, he's, it's a big ask to go from a six-furlong maiden special weight win into the Tampa Bay Derby, but Drip won a very fast maiden race, a legitimately fast maiden race at Fairgrounds on Feb 17. And then there are a few other horses in there as well. Maybe Otello from Christophe Clement might wind up going in there as well. TD, any thoughts on Tampa Bay Derby? I think just some general thoughts there is Tampa to me has always been a, a little bit of a twilight zone type of track as far as the racing surface is concerned. It's, it's a very sandy surface with steeply banked turns and, um, Back before my dad, Paul Thornton, retired from training, he split his stable between here in New England and Tampa Bay Downs. And every winter when he'd get his horses ready to go down to Tampa, he'd make a list and he'd get, get the ones ready he thought would excel down there. And none of them ever, the, the way that he planned it never came out right. Other horses would cycle up and, and, and really take to that surface. But it was a very track dependent type of racing surface there. And the quirkiness of the Tampa Strip is borne out in some of the recent race results. I know from 2017 to 21, some big long shots, all, all bigger prices than eight to one, one in those years. Last couple of years, it, it's been regressing back towards the mean betting wise with classic Causeway and Tampa Trice winning at odds on. Um, and of course, the only horse ever to, to parlay the, a win in the Tampa Derby and the Kentucky Derby was Street Sense back in 2007. We think that Locks might run. That's I don't believe Locks is is, uh, is going to be pointing for that race. That's that's not what I heard. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm interested in seeing uh, how domestic product uh, settles in this race. Uh, one thing I noticed watching all four of his races uh, in his first race, he took about ten races worth of kickback in one of the toughest maiden races at Saratoga. Just Steel, BU, and Lock were one, two, three. Then he wins at a mile and an eighth at Aqueduct, uh, basically dragging Manny Franco out of the saddle the first part of the race. He comes back in the Remsen. He's very keen behind horses in the Remsen and and backed up as a result. And then even in his second in the Holy Bull, they were going fifty. And 114 on the pace in front of him. So it's going to make a lot of horses a little bit keen. But he, again, did not settle very well behind horses. So maybe he's a work in progress, Zoe. Uh, remind me, did they take the blinkers off him in his last start? Yes. I'm not looking at yes. the PP. Yeah, and so I big... think he's going he's gonna to be better this time. Work in okay. progress. It, it might have been the pace that had him so keen sitting behind horses yeah. last time out. But, uh, they're probably not uh, going to go fast to Tampa either. All right. So what about the XP TV work of the week? Oh, let's get to it. Here we go. I actually have Leslie right here sitting next to me, and she is our key editor at XB TV. So she should probably be reading this. But I'll, I'll go right ahead. The TDM Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV and Leslie Abbott, our fine camera woman as well as editor. The work of the week is Hades. Hades breezed a half mile at Gulfstream Park Sunday morning in 48.64 for trainer Joe Orsino. Hades was the winner of the Holy Bull Stakes in his last start and is pointing to the Florida Derby on March the 30th, where again he will meet up with Fierceness, who was third after getting bumped in the start in their last meeting at Holy Bull. Hades did did work solo and work very, very nicely for trainer Joe Orsino. Now, last week's work of the week was Doorknob. He came back with a win. Will it be the same for Hades? All the thrills. 
fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The TD and Riders Room brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. It was like a sister-brother act when West Point's three-year-old Philly Sedona charged late to win a seven-furlong maiden special weight race at Gulfstream Sunday in her career debut because her full brother, first captain, did the same. He won his seven-furlong debut back in April 2020. That was at Belmont. He went on to win the Dwyer and the Pimlico Special. Both Sedona and First Captain were ridden by Jose Ortiz. Now, West Point and Partners went to $1.5 million to buy First Captain at the 2019 Saratoga Summer Sale. He was the co-sale topper. And what do they spend on Sedona? $2 million. Three years later, at the same Saratoga Summer Sale, Sedona topped that sale. Both First Captain and Sedona, bred by Bobby Flay out of his Mayor America, uh, one of the flagship mayors, of, of Flay's breeding operation. If you're interested in joining a West Point partnership and being vaulted into the world of instant camaraderie, you can learn more Woo! by visiting West Point. We were being vaulted. WestPointTB.com. <laughs> All right, and that's it for this uh, first week of March TDN Writers Room podcast. Thanks for joining us. For Zoe Cadman, TD Thornton, I'm Randy Moss. We will see you one week from today. Cheers, guys. Take care.